Jeff and I have, have sort of divvied things up a bit uh, to today focus on uh, computing essentially within the box like this, within a single computational node. And then tomorrow talk about using many such computers to solve a larger problem. Uh, in the end, uh, we're computing because we want to do science, and it's easy to lose sight of that. Um, these are fun, compelling things to play with at the low level, and uh, there's, there's lots of details to eventually get a grasp on. But sort of stepping back, really, uh, I see most of you are PhD students in chemistry and physics, that's what you get your degree for in the end. So getting the science out is preeminent. And it's what the funding agencies are paying myself and Daniel and Jeff to deliver. Um, and there, of course, the emphasis on productivity, translating new ideas into computer code to solve that science. And having that be correct, so correctness is a, a really big deal. Um, and so computer codes get big. So how many of you, you, you use an ab initio chemistry code, like N of EK or something like that? There we go. Excellent. Okay. Those codes are huge. Have you actually looked at the source code? Has anyone who's got the source code for one of these things and sort of has a sense about how big it is? Right? There's a few million lines of code. Uh, so that immediately says that if you're developing software in these packages, you're automatically in some sense a software professional. And things like software engineering concepts end up being not things you have to pay lip service to, but things that are essential to life. So I think probably a lot of stuff that was discussed last week about make files, coding conventions, or software repositories and so on, that's just bread and butter. Uh, that's, I mean, that's going to be a constant element going forward. Uh, and that, that aspect of software being maintainable is really crucial. And part of that is moving it, not moving onto future computers, moving onto other computers. Because these packages live a long time. Does anyone know how old games is? Who uses games? Do you know how old it is? Would you be depressed if I told you it was over 40 years old? Some bits of it. Right? That's, that's a fact of life. Codes, that much code takes hundreds of many years of effort to develop, and therefore it lives a long time. Whether it's good or bad. Right? Usually the good stuff lives longer, but not always, when right? you just look at other products in the marketplace. So that's how much value in the end software has. And of course, uh, it's you guys in the end doing the science, right? I know Daniel likes to think that he's super productive when he's coding late at night. And he probably is, I don't want to put it down. But you guys outnumber it, right? So you guys are going to do the science. Um, and so all, none of this is about high performance computing. This is about correctness, productivity, software engineering. We're, we're interested in high performance only because we want to do big calculations or we want to do a whole load of them. Uh, and again, our initial chemistry is a great example of calculations that really are open-ended in how long they take. What seismic shift has happened in our community over the last five years is that prior to about five years ago, most calculations were the input was generated by a human and the output was read by a human. These days, that's actually changed quite a bit. High throughput computing and the realization that we can use our tools in chemistry and material science for designing new molecules and drugs and uh, materials and so on, this whole materials by design concept has led to most calculations now actually being generated by a computer and the output read by a computer. So there's really been a really big shift, and that sort of put even more emphasis on performance because uh, people that didn't used to run calculations before, say engineers and a lot of experimentalists, now have the ability to run very large numbers of calculations. Uh, so in high performance computing, uh, we don't just have science correctness as being a, a, an issue 
performance is an issue. So really the questions we're going to try and focus on over the next few days are, well, how do we really in practice make the computer run fast? You've already seen some of that with the discussion on computer architecture and glass libraries and things like that. Uh, but we want to do this while not kind of screwing up everything else that we're worried about, productivity, portability, longevity of the code, and so on. Uh, so we want to do that on current machines and on future machines. If the code's going to live years and decades, then what computer should you be designing this code to run on? The one that you've got right now? Or the one that's going to appear 10 years from now? Well, that's kind of tricky, because the one that appears 10 years from now, you don't really know what it's going to look like. But you've got a pretty good idea what's going to happen over the next three to five years. And what we have to do is take, abstract out some concepts that sort of give us a path forward. And so we sort of have to sort of understand where things are going, and understand the software technologies that help us piece these things together. And Somewhere in there, there's some bad news because really the software technologies, the programming models, really aren't keeping up with the hardware and computer technology. So things are still kind of a bit grungy, to be honest, in the way we have to write high performance code. That's changing. I mean, I would say there's reason, reason to think that, say, uh, five, ten years from now, uh, there'll be a, a, a lot cleaner ways of writing high performance scientific software, but right now we're in a bit of a transition period. Uh, some of the technology trends that maybe we discussed earlier in the week is that real processors in terms of their clock speed aren't getting any faster. And that's because, well, we can't pump enough power, can't pump more power into these very small chips without melting the darn thing, basically. Uh, so what does that mean? That means that, that there's a, a, a joke that was commonly banded around that the right thing to do for a graduate student in computational science is go to the beach for the first three or four years of their PhD thesis and then run all the calculations in the last year. Because the computers were constantly getting faster, so why bother, right? You could do everything in the last year that you could have done in the, last, in the first two or three. That ain't true anymore. So you guys are unlucky. Right? <laughs> the previous generations enjoyed that. Another aspect is this memory wall, in that not all technologies are created equal, so that processors are not getting faster in terms of clock speed, but they're getting more capable, that you're getting more cores on each socket, you're getting more powerful floating point units, and we'll see some of that. Uh, and that's happening essentially a doubling every two or three years or so, the capability of each of these chips. But the memory technology, right now at least, isn't increasing at the same rate. And that's in part not really due to the underlying silicon technology, because in the end silicon is silicon, they could make the chips faster. It's just that these things are standardized into so many technologies that uh, they have to shift a much larger industry to implement this change. However, one thing that is changing is that uh, if you've ever seen a, a DIM, uh, a memory card, it's got a bunch of little chips laid out like it horizontally. Uh, so the chips are talking through wires, and that's slow and takes a lot of energy. What they're actually doing now is stacking these chips one on top of each other with the silicons basically, silicon layers basically touching each other. So much denser packing, much faster communication. That's actually going to lead to maybe close to a factor of 10 increase in performance speed of memory in the very near future. Some technologies are already delivering this now. So we're going to see some changes in technology that change these characteristics. But this is roughly going to remain true. But compared to processors, memory is slow. And that's, you'll see very soon, it's going to be a major challenge for getting high performance out of computers. So because the clock speed isn't getting any faster, and we're getting more and more transistors on a chip, and we all can also have lots and lots of chips. Parallelism is the only path forward to increase performance, at least at this point in time. So as previously, you used to be able to wait for the computer to get faster. Now you have to do something. 
and that do something is find lots of things for the computer to do at once. And it can be a variety of different things because the computer has different levels of structure. Um, at the very finest grain, what does a computer do? It executes instructions like get this number from this address in memory and put it in a register, add these two numbers together. Uh, so you can overload, overlap multiple instructions in this multiple instruction, multiple data uh, uh, model. Or we can operate on multiple numbers at the same time. So you've seen that as well, I think, in S presentation. And that's a single instruction acting on multiple data items of symbol. But that's the, the, really the finest grain parallelism that we have in the computer. At the medium grain, well, uh, this is a dual core computer. Oops. Uh, each core is actually hyper-threaded, so there's actually sort of four cores in there. Uh, so one socket, four cores. Uh, has anyone got a quad-core computer? I bet somebody in the room does. Somebody played games, you've got to have one? Oh, good, okay. How about somebody who's got a high-end computer that has got a, like a GP GPU card in it or something? There's lots more cores in them. So at, at this level, uh, the core is obviously in like a real processor, a chunkier thing than a single instruction. So the one where you sort of label that medium grain parallelism. And again, the cores are logically working independently. So it's multiple instruction streams operating on multiple lots of data. <laughs> the very coarsest grain, we can take all of these computers, tie them together with MPI or some other parallel programming model, and uh, now have a very coarse grain uh, approach. Clearly, this is working on words or short vectors, so fine grain. This is working on things on the scale of you know, entire things that fit into an entire computer. These are talking to get uh, at the speed of the very closest elements on a chip. These are talking together over a network. So you can see you need different mechanisms and probably different programming paradigms to, to make all this work. We've actually got some good news in that up until, again, I don't know, five years or so ago, uh, the only thing that technology was delivering was more of this stuff. So now we're at the point where on the very largest computers, you've got maybe uh, two or three hundred thousand nodes which is frightening. Finding that much coarse grain parallelism in our science is really tough. The good news is that uh, really we're maybe not going to see much growth at this level, at least for a while. What's going on is the technology companies, Intel, NVIDIA, and AMD, are consuming more and more transistors on the chip, which is giving us more of uh, this stuff. And actually, it's this stuff that's underutilized in our code. And it's actually, to some extent, also quite useful for science. So <coughs> a few hundred thousand computers tied together with a network really doesn't make a small molecular dynamics calculation run any faster. More, a whole bunch of uh, fast vector units on a chip and a lot of cores that can coordinate really intimately may actually make that calculation run quite a bit faster. So some things that up until recently sort of had no hope of accelerating now have at least some hope of advancing. So uh, technology is actually doing quite a bit over the next few years. So we've got these various architectural units or as uh, elements. And uh, how do we match that up against that software? And then how do we express that software? How do we express those uh, elements of the software? What tools should we use? Most of what Jeff and I are going to be talking about a standard uh, programming models. And there's maybe a couple of reasons for that. These standard models are supported on all of the computers, so they're portable. Um, you can rely on good, high quality, high performance implementations being available. And in some sense, they're complete. That all of the elements you're going to need are really there. Uh, that's not to say they're sort of like the best thing that we can possibly do right now. 
but they're the tools that essentially uh, we have at hand that we can rely upon. We'll talk briefly, probably on Wednesday, about things beyond uh, these standards-based models. But uh, those are things that you should sort of be knowledge of, knowledgeable of because the concepts are useful and maybe sometimes you have a problem where it's really convenient to step outside of the standards and use a non-standard tool, but you have to be aware at that point that, okay, you're taking some responsibility for keeping that tool working or knowing somebody that, you know, implements it or whatever. So within, within a core, we have various levels of parallelism. I'm going to talk about pipeline units maybe next. Uh, and so really there, what we're talking about is fine-grained parallelism. So we need to give the computer at the instruction level lots of things to do at once. So the main emphasis on this talk is going to be working on vectors and matrices. But really, you can get a long way on modern x86 processors by just having a fat loop with lots of number, number crunching going on. Having a very thin loop that is just copying a number from one place to another in memory, or just adding two vectors together, that's not going to run fast in any sort of real sense. Um, and pretty much all of this work is done for you by the compiler. You can get down and dirty and start writing low-level assembly or slightly high-level constructs. But these days, especially with the state of the, the current Intel compiler, that's the one that's installed on poker speed, uh, actually there's really relatively little need to do that. We'll see an example uh, later on where actually it's useful. <coughs> We're talking about programming at the medium grain within a node, in other words, driving multiple cores, then the concepts we're working with are now integrated. We're working with processes and tasks and threads. So the con has the concept of thread come across anyone yet? So, so the thread is like a mini process, and we'll discuss these in detail a bit later uh, this morning. Uh, and instead of just working on single vectors, up here, really, we need to be working on matrices, things with nests of loops where we can divide work in larger chunks between uh, the cores. Um, and later in the week, we're going to, uh, somebody's going to talk about accelerators, whether that's like a NVIDIA GP GPU or other things. These are cards that plug into a computer and uh, on, at least on some special operations, extremely fast. And we have to be able to talk about programming those. Uh, over here, so once we start talking about this medium brain parallelism, the main tool within science at least is OpenMP. I'm just going to talk about that when I get uh, finished. There are other approaches out there, uh, P threads, POSIX threads, uh, I'll talk about at the end of the morning. Uh, PPB, uh, Thread Building Blocks, which is a product from Intel, so not a standard, but still widely available. Uh, and then uh, we have this OpenCL thing, which is uh, really a programming concept that was initially developed for accelerators, but is gaining relevance in this multiple world. Okay. I may or may not touch on that, but just, you can Google around. And then finally, at the course grain, we have to have multiple nodes talking to each other. And the main concept in the community right now is this message passing interface. And really, uh, you're going to put a lot of effort into that. If you look at the performance of computer programs, we've got all these levels of concurrency. Uh, where do you think the biggest problem these days is? In, say, let's just say computational chemistry. Where, where do you think the performance issue is? So uh, let's not think about these super big computers. Let's just say you've got a cluster of eight nodes. You take the computational chemistry code. Uh, and let's pick a, two different types of calculations. Let's do a DFT calculation on a large molecule. And then let's do a couple cluster calculations. 
So what, where do you think the performance bottleneck is? What, which of these levels keeping a core running as fast as possible, keeping multiple cores busy, or keeping each of the nodes busy? In the end, the, the problem shifts around depending a bit on what you're doing. If you're doing something like a couple cluster calculation, what we're going to see is that, uh, well, the couple cluster is, ends up being implemented as lots of matrix multiply operations. And matrix multiply turns out to be perfect for pretty much every computer you run on. Uh, I'll add some caveats to that maybe later. But actually, so matrix multiply drives computers at very high speed. So it drives cores to high speed, can keep multiple nodes busy. And as long as you're doing a big enough couple cluster calculation, actually you'll keep all of the nodes busy. On the other hand, if you're not doing matrix multiply, you've just got some grungy compiled code you evaluate into electron integrals, or you're working through some graph or something, the problem is almost certainly here. What we're actually going to see is that Probably a lot of code is running factor of 10 too slow in this space. Uh, certainly the computationally intensive code that we have in chemistry, there's, there's lots of room for improvement there. Uh, and in part that's because as a community we forgot some valuable lessons. Back in the 1980s and early 90s, the big supercomputers were these cray vector computers. Uh, I use the magical word vector, and uh, what that, again, that means just uh, Cindy style parallel programming, and uh, to get good performance on those machines, you absolutely have to be writing vectorized code. Uh, and we got good at it. As a community, actually, chemists who were sort of in the front of the world in understanding how to do this and getting good performance. But then along came all these processes from IBM and Intel, uh, x86s and so on. And on those, originally, you didn't need to write back the code to get good performance. So we stopped. And sort of as a community, we forgot how to do it because it skipped a generation or two. And now we're back in this era where the only path to increase performance is parallelism. And one of the main sources of parallelism is vectors inside the processor. Uh, so we've sort of got to rediscover that and actually rewrite quite a bit of code. Uh, okay, so we can overthink all of this. Writing back to code actually is pretty darn easy. Right? You write a list, you use the right compiler switches, and your list vectorizable. Well, it's running vectorized. Right? So this loop here, uh, it, it's perfectly vectorizable. I'd say in C++, it, it's not very standard to say, standard compliance to say this external routine, EXP, which is, we think, is calculating the exponential of this number inside, but actually C++ would let you say it's doing anything you want to at all, because it's just an externally linked routine. Uh, but actually, the Intel compiler will happily vectorize this. <coughs> so, uh, and that's because it's got a vectorized version of the exponential routine. Uh, so what we want to do is first off fine tune our understanding of the performance of vectorized stuff. Uh, uh, actually, here's just an example of the whole process, just showing how, really how easy it is. So uh, sitting in my uh, login account on Pokerspeed, and I think it's the account number four, that all of these source files are sitting. Uh, so this routine here, there's an, a loop that initializes a vector just to a bunch of indices, and then we just kind of add up all elements of that vector. So I compile the program, and this line here is very useful. It, it generates a lot of junk. So sometimes you want to switch it off with a large compilation. But if you do performance tuning, it's absolutely essential to understand you know, what's working, what, what's running fast, and so on. What it's saying here is that 
on line five of this file, uh, a fused loop is vectorized. Uh, so who understands what fused means? Okay. So there's two loops here, and I uh, initialize the array in this loop, and then I'm adding everything up in this loop. So, uh, and in between, I'm initializing this variable to zero. Okay? And here, it, here in lies a, a valuable lesson. Well, the compiler actually has a much more detailed knowledge of the code than you do at the lowest level. You understand at the high level what you're trying to do. The compiler understands at the low level what you told it to do. And the two, of course, may be different. In this instance, the compiler simply said, uh, okay, I can join these two loops together as if I'd written just one loop to initialize A and then uh, add up the elements of A. And in doing so, it's actually saved a bunch of work because here it has to write I into memory and here it has to read A back from memory. Here, the compiler knows enough to say, okay, I can eliminate the read operation by just fusing these two loops together. And the fact that I wrote this in between doesn't matter because sum isn't used up here. It can, use, it can move this zeroing out as far up in the code as it wants. So the compiler is moving code around left, right, and center. Uh, so especially as we start talking about having multiple processes or threads communicating through memory, uh, this idea that code can get moved around, that it's not where you put it, uh, is actually an important thing. Okay, so the compiler was smart enough to merge these loops together, and then it factorized it, and well, it brings out the right answer. Okay. So it's that easy. So when, as soon as we start talking about uh, high performance code, again, performance is a correctness issue. Uh, well, we understand scientifically how to reason about the correctness of our codes. We have a mathematical representation of your equations. Uh, if you're writing in Fortran, Fortran stands for formula translation. And it's actually still much better at that than C++. So what we really want is the same way to reason about the performance of our programs, and there are performance models that we can write down for our codes. Uh, so for a simple loop or uh, communication of data, passing data across a network between two processes or something, we can sort of calculate the time it takes to do n operations, and there's some overhead associated with anything we do. But even if we're doing you know, a zero length loop or sending a zero length message, there's some overhead, there's some latency, and then there's a bandwidth, the, num the amount of time per, uh, I'm sorry, the number of elements per unit time that we can compute for it. So that's the time phase, latency and bandwidth are the two important ingredients. Um, so then the rate, is just, of course, n divided by the time, which is this thing. Okay. And of course, asymptotically, if we're doing a very long operation, the rate is just the bandwidth. Okay. And a, a really interesting number that sort of measures uh, how, uh, what you have to do in order to get good performance out of a system is this n a half number that was introduced a long time ago. I think it's by uh, so this n a half says, uh, how big does n be, n have to be, for me to get 50% of peak performance? So it says, this is this statement here, so we solve for n a half, and it turns out to be bandwidth times latency, which is a nice, easy, easy thing to remember. Uh, Obviously, there's nothing magical about 50%, and you might be interested in higher performance, say 90%, and that comes out to be nine times bandwidth times latency. Okay. So let's think about a typical high performance computer sending messages. We're not actually going to talk about sending messages until tomorrow, but it's this classic example. Let's say the latency to send a message between two nodes is about five 
microseconds. Okay, Daniel, sorry to thank you. On hockey speed, what is the interconnect? Is it uh, infiniband or? Uh, I think so, but I can check. Well, that's I think it's QDR. QDR, okay, good. Okay. Okay. So, uh, the InfiniBand network probably does indeed have a latency around five microseconds, so this is sort of vaguely representative of what you'll see on open speed. Yeah, it's um, QDR. QDR it's bandwidth is, yeah, it's going to be about a gigabyte a second. It is QDR InfiniBand. Okay, cool. So that means you've got to be sending a message of about a kilobyte in order to get the 50% of peak speed. So that formula is very useful in sort of setting the scale of operations you need to be doing. Okay, so let's look through each of these levels of parallelism in a sort of fine uh, grain level, because that's what we're talking about right, for the rest of the talk. Uh, so pipeline functional units. Uh, people have, and valuably so, a serial, completely sequential model of computing. So in your mind, you're telling the computer, do A, then do B, then do C. Um, so if you write your uh, for loop or your do loop, you're thinking that's the order in which things happen. You write down just sequential statements, A equals five, C equals 25 plus blah, blah, blah. Just sequential statements, that's the model that you've got. What we've already seen is that the compiler actually doesn't respect that model. The compiler just wants to give you the, res the do the instructions that gives you the equivalent result. Right? And it wants to arrange those instructions so that you get maximum speed. Uh, so there's uh, parallelism uh, inside the functional units because a, say a, multi a multiply operation it takes quite a long time to complete. Let's say it takes, uh, how long did I use here? Three cycles to complete. Okay. Uh, a very long time ago, I mean literally 30 or 40 years ago, computers did indeed do a multiplier, and sit and wait for it to finish, then start the next operation. But that hasn't been true for about that length of time. Really what happens is you can issue a multiply operation every single cycle. And it still takes three or four cycles to finish, or maybe more. Uh, but uh, so the result isn't available for quite a while, but you can be issuing a new multiply every single cycle. So that's what's going on here. If we multiply A0 and B0 together on cycle one, and it then starts working its way through the pipeline until the result is eventually available on cycle four. And in the meantime, we can be starting more operations. And so there's this pipeline that res the results are winding their way through. And so this is, this is actually parallelism even within single instructions. So the computer is trying to break apart a single instruction into multiple operations so that it can overlap things and make things faster. Um, so uh, pipeline execution Again, it's just like the, it fits to the performance model that we had before. Uh, the n a half is just the latency minus one. So here, the, to get uh, half the peak performance on that machine for that model, we have to have a loop length of about two or three. To get 90% of the performance, we need a loop length of 18. A real uh, x86 processor uh, has a lot of things going on all at once. Uh, the processors on Hokey Speed are sort of uh, not quite at the current generation, at least on, on the logging though, but it hasn't played in with the computer yet. Um, each processor can be doing uh, six or seven instructions at a time. Uh, you can be issuing multiple integer instructions. So let's say on a, uh, on a loop, you've got the loop counter that you need to increment. Uh, you need on the loop to do a test of branch. So how do you finish the loop iteration? Uh, you can be doing a floating point multiplier, a floating point addition, all of these operating on vectors, and also loading data or putting data to and from memory. All of those things can be going on at once. 
And in addition, uh, these units are Python, actually the memory unit is Python as well. So there's lots of parallelism going on inside here. Another level is that the next generation of processors, Haswell, so these are coming out right now, you can already buy some Haswell laptops, have got flow component multiply have uh, instructions. So instructions that can actually do a multiply and an add operation at the same time. So it's, this template is a single instruction. So again, uh, all of this gets done for you by the compiler as long as you're giving it enough to do and your code is structured so that the compiler can do it for you. Uh, so finally, the send the operations, operations on a single vector. Uh, here uh, we have two four element vectors. I picked four elements because the uh, most recent processors, the, uh, this has got a Sandy Bridge processor in it, then the immediate Yakut the Ivy Bridge, and then there's Haswell that I mentioned. They all have in the, in addition to the older SIMD stuff from Intel, uh, these ABX instructions that have four double precision numbers in each of the vectors that they can operate on. They can obviously operate on shorter ones, but uh, they, the vector is fundamentally four elements long in double precision numbers. Uh, and we can, in a single instruction, element-wise, multiply the two of the elements of each of the vectors, producing the result uh, that is the vector of each of the elemental uh, products. Uh, the older x86s, which is representative of at least the logging node on Hogan Speed that I played with, have these SSC invariants of it, uh, instruction sets. Uh, and they're, they're the vectors two doubles. There's another generation of Intel technology called many integrated core, and they're the vectors actually eight double the precision numbers long. Especially for ABX uh, and this instruction set, there's a whole zillion different types of operations. And the very key element we'll see is this uh, ability for predication, and I I'll show you what that means when we start talking about the Monte Carlo example. Uh, and I, this was a long URL, so I shortened it, uh, and it just takes you to a, a specification of the ABX instruction set for the uh, Haswell chip. Uh, so the width of this vector unit contributes to you know, the amount of work that we need to provide the computer to do to keep it busy. So we saw that if we wanted to get 90% of peak speed, we needed uh, nine times the uh, latency, which in this case is the pipeline that minus one. But now because we're operating on, if W is the width of our vector, of W elements at a time, we need a factor of W more work. So that actually means that uh, if W is 4 and L is equal to 4, which is about the right number, so multiply on the laptop, then actually to get 90% of peak speed on a simple loop that's just multiplying two numbers, we need to loop that one. This is a sequential computer. Every, every computer is in parallel now. Uh, so, what's the scary, uh, I mean this, this is restating really what I just said in a more direct way. So serial scalar computation, the original model that I said produces a result, you wait for the result, start the next operation, wait for it to complete. That produce one, produces one result for every uh, L cycle, so L is the pipeline set. A pipeline SIMD process is producing W that will provide vector results every single cycle. So the difference between these is a factor of W times L, which is 16, again, for my laptop. So the difference between purely sequential and optimal uh, vectorized pipeline performance is a factor of 16. 
Um, actually, there's a multiply and an add we can do at the same time, so it's a factor of 32. Okay. So if you're comparing really junky, unoptimized code to heavily optimized code, in the, high, in the best scenario, or the worst scenario, it's a factor of 32. This scenario is actually relatively easily realized. And a lot of people, you'll see these benchmarks where they talk about these GP, GPUs and things being hundreds of times faster than CPUs. It's usually because the CPU code isn't well optimized. CPUs are now getting up in speed with the fastest GPUs. Uh, okay, so let's now look at some of the performance characteristics that we get out of, out of this code. So here's an operation. It's not, this is actually a classic operation. It's known as stack speed, so D for double precision, with S for single precision. Uh, and then it's A times X plus Y, stack speed. And there's an Intel vector math library that's pretty heavily optimized. But these days, now their compiler is much better. You don't have to use this very often. But here's the equivalent subroutine call from DAX okay. So what we can do is run this loop a few times, and uh, as a function of n, measure how long it takes, how many cycles it takes per iteration. Okay. So like any good experiment or any good calculation, we should really know the answer before we run it, just uh, at least in the sanity check. So what are we expecting to see here? Do people have a mental picture in their mind about what this graph is going to look like. Number of cycles per iteration versus n. So is it going to be a straight line? Is it going to be coming up? Is it going to go down? So think about it. So so this is what we get. Okay. This was running actually on uh, a Dell machine that I recently brought. But uh, basically, it's basically using a Sandy Bridge processor. Uh, we've got two versions of the code. We've got the inline code as well as the BML routine. So let's start on the bottom left-hand side. And actually, I started at 16. Uh, because the the uh, vector math routine shot up to be 56 elements per cycle, 56 cycles per element. So it really dwarfed the scale, so I just chopped the graph off a bit. The inline code dropped off much sooner. It probably peaked at only about five cycles per element when we got down to one. So first off, why are we getting this difference between the inline code and calling the subroutine for very short loop lengths. Well, because we're calling a subroutine, right? Instead of just add, you know, multiplying and adding a number, uh, we're calling a subroutine. We've got all sorts of setup and startup associated with that. So actually, the subroutine call overhead is 50 cycles or so. That's probably pretty fast, actually. Uh, so what that says is that if you're operating on lots of short vectors, Subroutine call overhead is going to be big, so you probably don't want to be calling subroutines, you want inline code. Uh, so, as we increase the vector length, we see this structure here. What's that from? Caches. Caches, that's right. Yeah. So, Ed discussed all of that. And this is a sandy bridge, and it's actually got three levels of cache it's got L1, L2, L3, and then we hit main memory. So we can see bits of the architecture being revealed here. So then we can see that actually the fastest it runs is at half a cycle per element. Wow, that's pretty cool. A half a cycle to do something. Well, do something is load two numbers from memory, multiply those two numbers, add them onto one of the original ones, and write the result back. It does all of that in half a cycle. Element. Okay. So, uh, so in two cycles, right, the, the machine can do two memory operations per cycle, but we've got three to do. We have to read two numbers and store a result. So actually, the best we can do is run 
uh, the loop in two cycles. But we're operating on four things at a time, and so this is going to be our speed. Uh, four iterations every two cycles. Okay, so that explains that. And then if we look at these cache sizes uh, on this machine. Uh, all I've done is translate the measured numbers here into these bandwidths. Actually, the caches are faster than this. I mean, the, the inefficiencies in the way things are being used. This cache is actually capable, I think, of doing 64 bytes per cycle. So basically, you can see here the relative decrease in speed. Uh, and uh, so we have a, what, a factor of about seven, maybe eight in difference in speed between L1 and the main memory. So that right there is the important lesson that especially for vector algorithms, uh, it's very important for data to be in the level of cache. So cache was discussed. So what's the typical difference between L1 and L2 and L3 in most processors? Usually L1 is private to a core, right? Usually a core has its own L1 and these things are shared. All the other cores are sharing L2, L3 in my memory. Uh, so I measured this with a single thread, single process running on an idle computer, so no one else was competing for this bandwidth. What would happen on a, a busy computer or a computer that you were running on a parallel job? Well, actually, this bandwidth is shared. So actually, uh, this, these numbers will be worse because you'd be competing for that bandwidth with other activities on the computer. So uh, cache good, memory slow, and shared cache, depending on what's going on in the system, can be good or bad. Okay. Once you get to play on the computer, then I'd say change some aspects of the code, right? One key thing here is previously we were incrementing i by one. What happens if that increment isn't one? What happens if it's something bigger? Right. So play with that. Uh, the next couple of pages, we've just got some links and stuff, um, so when these slides are up, the links will be useful to you. A key element is read the damn documentation. Uh, actually, it's not bad. The Intel documentation uh, is good. There are a bunch of other compilers out there, the Portland Group compiler, IBM compiler. Uh, that documentation, in the end, isn't just useful about telling you about actually the, the vast array of functionality in these Compilers, but when they're telling you what the compiler does, it actually is introducing lots of useful concepts to you. So uh, I'd say a very productive thing you can do is read through uh, the full C++ or if you like Fortran compiler documentation at least once, right? Skim it, but uh, at least have a sense of what's on most pages. And then there's a bunch more things. Uh, so we have to have code, we have to have loops and code that's vectorizable. What on earth makes a vectorizable loop? Uh, well, the key element is uh, a lack of dependencies between iterations. So here's an example of a loop where uh, we're assign assigning uh, from element i to element i minus one. So we're essentially shuffling the uh, array sideways. Uh, this, this actually, as I've, I've written it, uh, might actually be vectorizable, because all we're doing is taking a loop and moving it sideways. Uh, and in the order of iteration, there's actually not got any dependencies. But if I put it the other way around, if I had a of i equals a of i minus 1, what I'd be doing then is propagating something up the loop in a non-vectorizable way. Here's another aspect of possible dependencies, which also goes by the name of aliasing. And it also shows a difference between programming language and, st and standards. Uh, here's a C or C++ routine in which we're just copying B into A. And there's no dependencies apparently between the loop. The loop index is going to uh, sequentially. Uh, so it seems vectorizable, 
But in C and C++ it's not, because the, the standard for those languages uh, says make no assumptions that arguments point to a, arguments to a procedure point to different regions of memory. So it may be that A and B are overlapping, at which point you know, the compiler doesn't know what's going on. So the compiler has no choice whatsoever but to generate code that reads an element of B, writes it into an element of A, and then goes back and does it one at a time sequentially. Fortran's different. Fortran says uh, uh, arguments coming into a procedure can be assumed to point to discontinuous or disjoint sections of memory. So immediately the compiler in Fortran will be able to vectorize this. So that's one reason why historically people were getting better performance from Fortran than uh, C++ and C. Well, that standard's been fixed. I mean, you can uh, tell the compiler when you compile it to please don't assume aliasing. Uh, or actually, there's a keyword, the uh, restrict keyword. If we um, written our declaration like this. This, uh, I guess that's in an argument, so we want to come out. This says, this keyword here says, A doesn't point to anything that overlaps anything else that you are going to be using in this compilation. So now, immediately, the compiler's got enough information to vectorize that. The compiler's got to be able to figure out how long the loop is before it starts executing the loop, because it wants to vectorize things. It wants to divide up the iteration space into lumps of work. So if you're messing around with the loop index or the loop counter, well, the compiler just says, well, I can't figure out what's going on. So fix, you want to keep this fixed, then don't mess with that. Uh, I had an example previously where we were calling the EXP routine. So the Intel compiler will recognize if you included the standard map header file and haven't redefined it, it will just assume that it's uh, the map routine and it will vectorize it for you. That's because it knows about X. What we'll see in an example soon is that if the compiler can see the definition of your function, most easily if it's in the same file, then actually it will just inline it. Modern compilers are stunningly good at this. They'll, you'll write a piece of routine up here, uh, and the compiler, unless it's really generating uh, a lot of wasted instructions or space, it just simply copies that code and pastes it in, as if that routine never existed. Uh, sometimes it's confusing, because you're trying to see where the time is spent and that routine name isn't there because it literally has vanished. Uh, but actually, it's very good in this context because it means you can write a complicated loop body and things get simpler because you can move that loop body off into a, a routine that you can manipulate. If it doesn't see the definition of that function, if it's not inlineable, then uh, basically the compiler has to punt and say, OK, I'm not going to vectorize it. And this, we'll see some options to help fix that. Uh, if tests, um, the code example that I'm going to show you uh, actually has some vectorizable if tests in it. And I reported it as a, as a bug to Intel because the Intel compiler wouldn't vectorize it. Um, and so if tests are now completely vectorizable in the Intel compiler. Uh, with the caveat that they have to resolve into merging two vectors together, element by element. So, unfortunately, even though the compiler can figure out a lot of things about the lowest level of the code, it can't figure out that two vectors point to different regions, except by doing a possibly slow runtime test. Uh, and if you're doing some other complicated addressing, uh, sometimes the compiler just has no way of figuring things out. Uh, so there are various ways of passing information to the compiler to help fix that. Uh, 
this one at the top here is kind of like a, a blunt sledgehammer and it says ignore vective dependencies. So if you've got a loop that you believe to be uh, uh, vectorizable because there are no dependencies in it, then if you give put that pragma before the loop, then you're telling the compiler, just ignore what dependencies you think and please try and vectorize the loop. It may not vectorize it anyway due to some other problems, uh, but it'll at least ignore the dependencies. Now, of course, if there were dependencies and you put that there, what have you just done? You just generated incorrect code. Okay. So basically, now you're taking responsibility for telling the compiler things, and, uh, which have comes responsibility. Uh, this is a compiler option that uh, fine tunes that aliasing aspect that I spoke about, the difference between C and Fortran. This here is, is quite useful uh, uh, because if you've got a long loop, uh, then uh, the compiler can start making different choices about how to optimize it. If you've got a really long loop, most of your data is in main memory, and there are different ways of accessing the main data in main memory that may be more efficient than uh, if the data is already resident in the cache or something. Uh, and you've got cleanup code at the beginning and end of each loop that can just be different. So if you've got a short loop, you can tell the compiler that. And that's actually a useful performance thing. Uh, Sometimes you, you want the loop to be vectorized even if the compiler thinks it's so short or so messy or whatever that it doesn't want to vectorize it. Uh, alignment is not so much of an issue on modern computers, so it comes and goes. Um, this one is quite useful. Uh, again, if you've got a very long vector, that you're, say you're copying A into B, and you don't, you don't want to use B anytime soon, you don't actually want the write of B to go into the cache, because you'll just waste all that cache space. Uh, you want the writes to go back to main memory. Uh, this, this actually gives a hint to the compiler that that's what you want to have happen. This thing here fixes this problem that I was discussing of, you want to vectorize a loop with a, a function inside function call inside the loop, and you think that the inline contents of that function should be vectorizable, but when the compiler is compiling the code that's calling the routine, this function definition is invisible for whatever reason. Uh, basically, if you uh, have this attribute in the uh, associated with the function in the vector call and this attribute associated with the function where you decline it in line, the linker magically fixes all this up when it actually comes to link time. Uh, so this is actually documented in the manual. Typically you're not going to need that, but it's actually a useful tool. Uh, so what I want to do now is spend a few minutes looking at uh, a sample code that is sort of complicated enough to demonstrate some real world complexity and yet simply enough that we can get most of the code onto a slide. Uh, and so what we're actually going to do is run the Metropolis Monte Carlo algorithm. This is a standard numerical method for evaluating integrals in high dimensions. Uh, but what we're going to do is evaluate a very simple integral uh, with it just to try and understand uh, how, how to get high performance out of some of these constructs that uh, arise commonly. Uh, so we just simply want to compute this uh, expectation value. So here's our probability distribution, e to the minus x, and we basically want to compute the average value of x, which is 1. Uh, so we're going to start from uh, a random number generator that generates random numbers in the range 0 to 1. And, well, I uh, don't want to do some messy change of variables that makes things messier, 
So I'm just going to approximate infinity is 23 because e to the minus 23 is already small enough that we can forget about the rest. And, and here's, here's our loop. We initialize x to some number. And then pretty much forever, we uh, generate another random value of x. That should be 23, not 32. And uh, then the test for accepting this new value is uh, if the uh, value of our probability distribution function at the new point is greater than the old point times another random number, then we accept the new value. We do that a few hundreds or thousands of times, then the generated values of x are sampled from this probability distribution. So, uh, it's a nice technique. It's, uh, I don't know, 70 years old now or more. Uh, and so what that means is that after that equilibration or warm-up period, we're in a position to calculate uh, values. 